This week, we got a brand new Steam Deck, Nintendo squashes rumors about their next system, and more. So let's just go ahead, together, as a people, of course, and take it out. And welcome to another sensational Sunday. I'm Mike and I'm back to talk about the gaming news. So last week we talked about Microsoft's ban on unauthorized Xbox accessories and how you'll get an error code if you plug one in. I stated in that video that there was some speculation going on that this may be related to cheating and I gave the example of being able to use a mouse and keyboard in games that weren't designed for it and getting an advantage in like first person shooters and things like that. Well, apparently the ban isn't affecting one of the accessories that allow you to do that. So there's an accessory called the XIM input adapter, and it basically allows you to use a mouse and keyboard in any game by emulating a controller. So it's been confirmed as of right now, it's not affected by this ban. So it would seem that if Microsoft is doing this to crack down on cheating, then it's not gonna be foolproof. Now, the Game Rant article does point out that it will still reduce the people that use third-party peripherals to cheat, like controllers that enable macros to be used. It is possible that the way the XIM device communicates with the system, that it tricks it into thinking it's an authentic controller, so that may make it more difficult to block. But in any case, hope is still alive for people who wanna cheat on Xbox. Now, all jokes aside, it does seem like it'll be somewhat effective for helping with the cheating issues, and also just making sure people don't buy like super low-quality controllers by mistake. But like I talked about last week, it will negatively affect some people that were using the accessories for legit reasons. You know what else is legit? That leaked PS5 Slim release date we talked about a couple weeks ago because the bundles released on November 8th as what was previously reported in that rumor. So yeah, the new model is officially available and aside from it being smaller and lighter, it does have a little more storage going from 825 gigs on the original PS5 to one terabyte on the new console. Now the second part of the rumor was the standalone console will release a few days later, which hasn't happened, but that's probably for a good reason because they're actually selling the bundle with Spider-Man 2 included for 500. So basically you're getting the game for free. Now they're also running the same deal with the old PS5 model, which is weird because I would have thought that they'd be blowing these things out since Sony said that once they're gone, they're not making any more of those. And while the original digital model is pretty much sold out, there still seems to be a lot of PS5 fats out there. Is it too soon to start calling it the PS5 fat? It's possible that they're gonna wait until after the holiday season and see how many are left and then put them on sale. Either way, the new PS5 is officially here if you could find one because they've been selling out pretty fast. But you know what's not officially going to be here as of tomorrow? Sharing clips to Twitter on PlayStation consoles. Sony has announced that they are removing all Twitter or X, as it's now called, integration from the PS4 and PS5. And that includes sharing clips using the share button and linking your PlayStation account to Twitter. Now, the GameSpot article points out that you can still share clips using the mobile app or using the Share Factory app on the console, but it won't be as simple as just pressing the button and then you could just share it to Twitter. Now, Sony isn't alone in this move as Microsoft also removed their Twitter integration earlier this year from the Xbox, and Blizzard also removed it from World of Warcraft earlier this year as well. Now, it may seem coincidental that all of these services and platforms are starting to remove Twitter integration, but it's probably not coincidental because changes were made to Twitter's API policy last year, making it way more expensive to use. So yeah, this isn't super surprising considering that fact. It's probably not worth the cost for them to keep this integration, especially since the cost to use their API for bigger enterprises starts at 42,000 a year. But you know what doesn't cost you anything? Watching a trailer and a highly anticipated one is coming next month as Rockstar has announced that they will be showing a first look at Grand Theft Auto 6. Now next month is the 25th anniversary of the Grand Theft Auto series, so it makes sense for them to show something from the game. Also GTA 5 is 10 years old now, it originally released on the PS3 and the 360. This is the third generation of console that the game is going to be on, so yeah, I think it's about time for them to start showing the next game. I understand why they haven't done a new GTA in so long, which is basically because of how popular GTA Online is. But I personally don't play GTA Online, so I'm more interested in the story and the setting. And the rumors are it's going to be going back to Vice City, which makes sense because they haven't had a modern GTA game set in Vice City. GTA 4 was in Liberty City, and of course 5 is set in San Andreas. So yeah, I'm kind of excited to see what the new game is about after being thirsty for like 10 years for the next game. But Rockstar isn't the only one that will be releasing the trailer soon, as Nintendo has announced that they're working on another movie. So if you didn't know the Mario movie, it did really well for them. It did really well in general. So it makes sense that they want to work on another movie, which is The Legend of Zelda. 
and it's gonna be live action. So Miyamoto posted the following announcement on X, formerly known as Twitter. This is Miyamoto. I have been working on a live action film of The Legend of Zelda for many years now with Avi Arad-san, who has produced many mega hit films. I've asked Avi-san to produce the film with me, and we have now officially started development of the film with Nintendo itself heavily involved in the production. It will take time until its completion, but I hope you look forward to seeing it. So yeah, it sounds like they're just now starting production of the movie, so it'll probably be a while before we see any kind of trailer from it realistically. But as Miyamoto mentioned in the post, he's producing it along with Avi Arad, and personally, I'm surprised that they're doing a live action movie. I thought they would have stuck to animation since the Mario movie did so well, but I guess we'll see possibly in a few years what it turns into. Now to me, the most pressing question is who's gonna play Link and what sound is he gonna make when he swings a sword? Also, it better not be Chris Pratt. Like, I can't. I refuse. But the Zelda movie wasn't the only thing Nintendo talked about this week as they addressed some rumors about their next system. So more rumors started coming out about the Switch 2 in the last few months as we're approaching its seventh year on the market. And trust me, I'm not saying it's old, but it's looking to start applying to colleges next year. So back in August, there were rumors that Nintendo showed off Switch 2 dev hardware to developers and showed a demo of Breath of the Wild running at 60 frames per second, as well as a Matrix Awakens demo that's on PS5 and Xbox currently. There was also an email from the Microsoft Activision trial from Bobby Kotick, who was talking about an executive briefing that he had with Nintendo and basically said the performance target would be around a PS4 or an Xbox One and was saying that they could definitely make some compelling games for this hardware. So these rumors are kind of pointing to the dev hardware at least existing and Nintendo being in a phase where they're telling developers about it and its capability. Well, during a press conference for Nintendo's financials for the fiscal year, which ends in March 2024, they were asked about their next-gen hardware. So basically they said that they're constantly conducting research and development on new hardware and software, but they have no comments on the new hardware at this time. They go on to say that rumors were spread on the internet that were inaccurate and specifically call out a demo of new hardware that was given outside of Japan in summer of 2023. And they said that this information is inaccurate. Now, obviously Nintendo isn't gonna confirm anything that's rumored, especially for something that they haven't even announced yet. But as the IGN article points out, they said that them showing new hardware wasn't true, which is probably the case because technically the rumor was that they showed dev hardware. Obviously, from a financial standpoint, they didn't want to announce anything that might negatively affect the sales of their current hardware right now before holiday season. So that's why they probably felt it was important to address these rumors. People may not want to buy a Switch if they feel like a new one is right around the corner, and Nintendo has already acknowledged in previous investor calls that they were expecting hardware sales to slow down. So if they plan on releasing or even announcing a new system next year, that means that this is going to be the last big holiday sales-wise for the Switch. So it makes sense that they would want to squash any rumors that may deter people from buying a Switch right now. While we're sitting here waiting on new hardware from Nintendo, Valve just went ahead and dropped their new Steam Deck, and that's what we're talking about today. In our final story. So Valve went ahead and announced the OLED version of the Steam Deck. So this is a new version releasing on November 16th, and of course it has a new OLED screen. So this screen is slightly bigger, it's going from 7 inches to 7.4 inches, and it's getting a bump in this refresh rate to 90 hertz from 60 hertz with the original screen. Now this doesn't support variable refresh rate like we've seen with other handhelds recently where the screen can sync with the refresh rate of the game to provide a smoother experience, but 90 hertz is still nice to have, especially for games that can run above 60. On top of the new refresh rate, it also has HDR, which is almost enough for me to consider Digimon ROG Ally to go back to the Steam Deck. The Ally review is coming soon, I promise. I promise, I'm actually working on it. But other than the screen, it's also going to have a new Wi-Fi module that supports Wi-Fi 6E. It has a larger battery at 50 watt hours instead of 40 watt hours on the original. And now Valve is quoting that the battery is going to be from 3 to 12 hours instead of 2 to 8 like the original one was. Depending on what game and what power settings you use, of course. The RAM is also 16% faster, which will net a small performance improvement. There is a Linus Tech Tips and Dave 2D video on the new deck, and they test it. And it seems like you do get a few more frames on the new version of the Steam Deck. Now, the last thing that's changed is the storage. So before the max storage you could get out of the box was 512 gigabytes, but now they're going up to 1 terabyte. So when it comes to the pricing, it's going to be a 512 gig version for 549 and the one terabyte is going to be 649. I'm guessing the one terabyte option has to do with the price of the SSDs that fit into the Steam Deck dropping significantly. I've seen them regularly for around $90 now, whereas when I first got my Steam Deck, they were like double that price. There is one LCD model that's going to be sticking around, that's 256 gig, and it's going to be $400 replacing the 64 gig of that price. It doesn't have any of the internal upgrades, so no faster RAM, larger battery, or better Wi-Fi, 
but at least you get an SSD instead of the eMMC memory, and you get enough space to actually install some AAA games out of the box. Now, the old 64 gig and 512 gig models are being discontinued and are being sold at 349 and 449 respectively until they're sold out. So this is crazy to just launch out of nowhere. So if you haven't picked up a Steam Deck yet, you're looking at the new models, I would definitely go with one of the OLED models at this point. Now, if you do want to get the cheap one, $400 for the 256 is a way better deal than the original one was because the performance is still close to the OLED model. And like I said, the storage is usable out of the box. One of the things I criticized Valve for when I did my Steam Deck review was how bad the out-of-box experience is for the 64 gig. I basically recommended not to buy it unless you're planning to upgrade the internal storage, which was the reason that I bought that model to save a little bit of money. So I think getting rid of the 64 gig and offering 256 gig model at the same price is great. I think it makes sense for Valve to release this model because these new handhelds like the ROG Ally and the Legion Go were already offering better performance and higher refresh rate screens and were close to the price of the 512 gig Steam Deck, so it was getting hard to recommend. But now, with the OLED screen, HDR, and 90 hertz refresh rate, the Steam Deck really feels like a serious contender again versus just being a good budget option. And I'm gonna contend with the transition to the end of this video, but it's a fight that I'm gonna lose so I'm gonna just go ahead and bring it to a close. But let me know what you think in the comments down below about the Steam Deck OLED. Again, let me know down below. And if you enjoyed this video, then make sure to tell a friend, tell a coworker, like, share, and subscribe, and hit that bell notification to be notified when I drop a video or a live stream. And always release two things at the same time.